All right. Oh, wow. Hey, hi, everybody. Okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight and welcome to the first ever Brisbane Literary Mafia Zoom case. Um, tonight, we'll be hearing from three writers who all have a connection to the Brisbane literary scene, Cass Moriarty, Sally Piper and Bree Lee. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, on which I am broadcasting to you from, the Yagara and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, before I hand you over to Cass and Sally, I do have to tell you that one of our um, other brains behind this new Zoom case, Chrissy Neen, is unfortunately no longer able to join us tonight. She's fallen ill at the last minute, but um, as disappointed as we all are that she can't be joining us tonight, the wonderful Sally Piper, who is also a member of the Brisbane Literary Mafia, um, alongside Chrissy and Cass, has very kindly offered to step into Chrissy's shoes for the evening. So um, that's about enough for me. I'd now like to introduce Bree Lee, who will be joining Cass and Sally in conversation tonight. Bree is an author and freelance writer. Her journalism has appeared in publications such as The Monthly, The Saturday Paper, Guardian Australia and Crikey. Her first book, Eggshell Skull, won Biography of the Year at the ABIA Awards, People's Choice Award at the Victorian Premier Premier's Literary Awards and was long listed for the 2019 Stella Prize. She is also a non-practicing lawyer and continues to engage in legal research and issues-based advocacy. So Cass, Sally and Bree, I will let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma Kate. Um, and welcome everybody. So glad that you could all join us tonight. Um, we're really um, missing Chrissy, because she was in fact the brains behind this whole idea, but um, that's okay. Hopefully she's um, watching and we'll do a good job and we'll be all ready for her next month when she's um, up and running again. Um, a big welcome to Bree Lee, who's our special guest for the inaugural Brisbane Literary Mafia Zoomcast, and what better way to start it off. And thank you so much, Sally, for stepping in um, in place of Chrissy tonight. Yeah. Um, Bree, I thought I might start by um, asking you, what is it about Brisbane and Queensland writers? Because that's what this is all about, the idea that there is really something special about um, Queensland writers, whether they're still here or whether, like you, they've, um, you know, moved on and, and now live in a different part of the country, but at heart are still a Brisbane writer. What do you think it is that makes um, Queensland writers so special? Hmm. Thank you, Cass, and thank you, Em. Um, just before I answer, I would like to acknowledge that um, where I am in Sydney means I'm on uh, Gadigal land, and I pay my respects to elders past and present as well. Uh, what I think uh, is special about Queensland, um, a lot of things. What I would say is that I couldn't have written Eggshell Skull anywhere else. Um, and something I notice more and more as I uh, just read more and more and I read more and more widely or I try to every year um, is that I think often the centre is best written about from the margins. Um, and something I think that, because I can only really speak for myself because obviously writing is so personal, but I found that being in Brisbane and not, not being, essentially not being in Sydney or Melbourne when I was really in the first several years of um, just like taking my writing seriously, you know, knowing that it was what I wanted to do, trying to develop an almost daily, if not daily practice um, and not feeling myself to be um, in the middle of the sort of like industry hub of what we sort of seem to think about. I remember certainly I always had the impression that Melbourne was where all of the literary journals were. It was like sort of, you know, what do they call it? The city of literature for Australia. And I knew that all the publishers and all of the newspapers were in Sydney. Um, and being apart from those things, I think forces you to more consciously and perhaps more individually develop a kind of voice and a, almost like a set of priorities and perhaps even um, something more even intrinsic about your identity because you can't just step into the stream. You have to work at it. And I think what I would also add to that is that 
I was so constantly and wonderfully and absolutely supported by other Brisbane writers because you have to like, well, you don't even have to, you want to always be um, contributing to the community. Um, anytime I had a question, anytime I had a new goal or a, a something I was didn't, weren't just unsure about, like all I had to do was raise a hand and there would be five people happy to help. Um, and I am starting to find that in Sydney after being here for almost two years now. Um, but there was something very, very special about Brisbane um, in that regard. And I was just so lucky to be working at Avid for the like early years of taking my writing seriously, because to me, that's the kind of nexus for a lot of those um, sort of communities. And that was my experience. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think that's what this whole um, Zoomcast is about, is about celebrating um, the community of writers mm -hmm. and, and readers that we have in, in Brisbane and in Queensland. And I think you're right, it's a really special um, special time. So we asked you what you'd like to, to talk about tonight as a topic and you suggested what project should I work on next or, or what book should I write next. Um, tell us why that topic and, and why that's sort of timely or relevant for you at the moment. So the reason I wanted to talk about this was actually for the opportunity to talk to other people about this, um, because it's certainly not a kind of question or issue that I think I have the answer to. It's one that I spend a lot of time thinking about and wondering about and um, constantly trying to sort of like, I don't know, like recalibrate my compass or figure out the poles because for me, um, so Eggshell Skull was a memoir, um, my next book, Beauty, was an essay. Um, my next book will be Brains, which is the sister essay to Beauty. Uh, and then after that, seems like it will be fiction. Um, and for me, the decision of what to write next exists very, um, uh, what's that word when you're balancing something? It's like on the precipice between creative and commercial slash strategic considerations. Um, so these are all things, for example, beauty and brains and the novel are all things I knew I wanted to write. Um, but when I sat down and thought about what order they would come in, so this is in like 2018, when I just knew that Eggshell Skull might have done well enough to let me pick what I wanted to write next, which for me is the ultimate um, freedom and the ultimate privilege as a writer that I get to choose what project I want to write next but of course there's kind of like this anxiety that comes from having that option be so open-ended um, and I had seen for example the way um, in particular women and in particular young women writers who had ever done any kind of life writing if they then went straight into fiction were often just asked really crap questions and framed in a really crap way where their fiction was just sort of taken to be what like a kind of byproduct to life writing or that people would always ask them autobiographical questions about the fiction and essentially not take the fiction as seriously as I think they they should um, and so I um, wanted to give a bit of space and a bit of breathing room essentially between eggshell skull and between when the book came out when the novel came out because the novel is also about questions of um, power about questions of gender and sex and art um, because those are things that I'm genuinely interested in and I just felt like what I saw happening all the time was that women and in particular young women novelists just get asked all of these autobiographical questions about their fiction if people even seem to sniff out that it might be like about similar issues. Um, and in terms of beauty coming out and then brains, I mean, those are two things that I have a track record of being interested in asking questions about. Um, and that sort of dichotomy in terms of um, those being the two factors that people um, are sort of overwhelmingly either rewarded or or punished for either having or lacking um, and they 
it's sort of a springboard for much bigger questions around worth and what we think each other are worth. Um, and it just sort of happened quite organically that beauty came out first because um, both the essays have a fair amount of life writing in them and the issues in beauty were very much pushing themselves into my life um, around the time when I was thinking about what I would write next. So I just sort of let that happen. Mm. That's so, that's really interesting. Um, how you decide what to put a hold on and what to go ahead with and it sounds like it's happened fairly organically, but also with a plan in the back of your mind about how you wanted things to be. Yeah. And so it's like, um, I have found it really beneficial to be able to talk to my agent about this stuff a lot um, because I'll go to her, for example, and I'll say, you know, at any time I have these four things on the kind of cooker at the mo at any one time, just sort of saved in different drafts folders. And I talk to her and I say, like, I want to write forever what is the what is the image of myself as a professional that I want to project and then like build upon I'm not so it's I quite just, strategic yeah um, in terms because, of your career yes very much so um and at the real heart of it is that I think the worst possible thing I could do would be to rush mm. makes um, me I was thinking earlier Bree that you know you went into a career of law and it made me wonder who who younger Brie was. So was younger Brie a writer or was younger Brie always going to go into law? And was it that you wanted to do both but arm your writing with law? Or was it that you went into law but then were so disillusioned by it that you wanted to address that disillusionment through writing? So I guess I just want to know what came first, the, mm -hmm. the writer or the lawyer? I feel like there's probably an overlap of about 12 months where um, I genuinely never thought that being a writer would be a viable career option. Um, but I've always been a reader, like a, just, which I still believe to be the most important thing a writer can spend their time doing is reading and reading widely. Um, and I started the, the magazine that I used to run, which Em did with me um, for a while uh, called Hot Chicks with Big Brains, started that in 2015. Um, and that was online only for a while. And then we went into print um, and that was all nonfiction, but I was editing a lot of pieces about women and work. And um, I was going to literary festivals. Um, I think I volunteered at Brisbane Writers Festival for three or four years in a row, because at that time I couldn't afford tickets. Um, and if you got a gig as an artist liaison intern, you could um, ride in the back seats of cabs with authors on the way to their events and just sort of fangirl over them. So that was a great time. <laughs> Um, so there were several years where I was on track to graduate law. You know, I got this wonderful job. I really thought that I would end up practicing law. My interest was in intellectual property law and like trademarks and copyright. I felt like that would have been maybe a niche where I could do cases that I thought were interesting and a little bit creative or unusual, but still be practicing. Um, and then at the end of my year as an, as an associate, which I documented in the first sort of half of Eggshell Skull, um, I was just so burnt, burnt out, completely burnt to a crisp. Um, and I knew I couldn't go straight on to practicing because I was in a bad place. Um, and it was around about that time that towards the end of my year as an associate that I put together the proposal for what would end up being Eggshell Skull. Um, and then because the book sold on spec at the beginning of the following year, like at the beginning of the year after my associateship, and I got my agent and I got my publisher who were both incredible like wonderful women grace heifetz at left bank literary is my agent and jane Palfreyman and alan and Unwin is my publisher and they are just like the best um because that sort of came good and there was enough interest there and i wasn't ready to start practicing law straight away because my own trial was like still happening um i just thought i'd give it a crack um and i just told my partner and my parents that um i would give it 10 years and if I wasn't able to sort of make a, an income or just sort of support myself, or if I hadn't really, nothing had come good after a decade, then I would like happily um, go back to law because I, you know, had been admitted and I had all my qualifications. Um, but it seems like touch wood, that will not be necessary. <laughs> I think that decision's been made for you now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
So if you had to, just back onto the topic of, of what project to work on, if you had to give advice to people, to um, people in the audience tonight who maybe have their, like you, have their fingers in a few pies, maybe are working on some memoir, some nonfiction, some playing with some fiction or some poetry, what would be your advice about um, how to direct your attentions? Would it be be strategic about it or, or, or go with your heart or? Um, I think first and foremost, like there are some times that you will be working on a project and for, certainly if it's fiction where you actually feel like the characters have just started talking, you know, and you, you're on that role. Or it could be that you're working on nonfiction and something that you've been researching for a little while, <clears throat> excuse me, so it's like turns out to then start being in the news because there's been some development. Like you can always feel if, for some reason, it's like the treadmill has just like pushed itself up by five speed units. Like absolutely first and foremost, if you ever feel anything like that, I completely, I always let that run its course. Um, and I would say though that the strategic approach works for me because I have people who I really trust who are very familiar with the industry to bounce those ideas off. And that is a great privilege. If you have someone like that, um, absolutely offer to buy them a coffee or a beer or actually pay them for their time to pick their brain. Mm -hmm. um, because at the moment, for example, um, you know, a friend of mine had been working on an essay collection for a while and now it's just apparently I didn't know until she said so that's like a really bad time in the market to try and sell essay collections because of COVID and what publishers mm -hmm. are and aren't willing to take risks on. Like, it also depends if writing is something that you are doing um, in your spare time or if it's something that you are trying to um, make your full-time gig. There were certainly tons of freelancing I did that was not quite within the areas that I was like totally passionate about. And it was because I was trying to get a byline at a certain publication or mm -hmm. trying to pay my rent. Um, and I think what I would say overall is that um, don't, if you are thinking strategically or if you are thinking about what is relevant to the market or what you need to do to pay your bills, like don't think of that as some kind of cop out or think of that as some kind of like somehow um, what damaging your artistic integrity. Like there's just such an unhelpful mythos around the starving artist and that if you're strategic, then you can't be like real or true author or whatever. And the only people that helps are the people who secretly have trust funds um, who don't actually need to try and make their practice sustainable. Um, so yeah do what you need to do and what matches your sort of goals and intentions for your career. That's really great advice. Great mm -hmm. advice. Thank you. Sally, did you, um, I can't believe this time is going so quickly. Oh We've my gosh. Started. I know. Yeah. So Sally, did you have anything else that you'd like to um, ask? Yeah. Bree? I wanted to, um, on the weekend I finished reading Jess Hill's fantastic book, it's such a courageous book, see what you made me do. And which looks at domestic abuse. And I know this is one of your um, uh, major things that you're interested in too, Brie. And, and it, that book highlighted to me, as yours did, the um, just the, the need for law reform around policing and reporting and just the family courts as well. And I, I wanted, we're looking at these problems arising because of this male dominated profession. And now we've got the Dyson Hayden thing going on, of course. Mm. And it made me want to know from your experience, where, where do you see us in 10 or 20 years' time? It's such a deeply traditional profession. Could we even see significant change in such a short, really a short space of time for, for a profession that's been around for centuries? Um, I think there is a really... There are sort of two separate answers because um, there is a really big difference in the industry between the police and the, the sort of law, actual like legal profession. And that can include both lawyers and like the barristers and the judiciary and the courts. And the police are um, not, like obviously these things interact with each other. You know, if we have a terrible definition of consent as we do now, it means the cops are less likely to even investigate properly because they know it's not probably going to even go to trial. And if it did, it wouldn't be successful. Obviously those things interact with each other, but 
the culture problems within the Queensland Police Service are so very deep and so very devastating at the moment. Just like every month there are a handful of stories that make it to the news, which tells you that it's the sort of tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. about very, very, um, a very, very fundamental sort of misunderstanding and disrespect for gendered crime. And that can be both family, domestic and family violence, as well as sex crimes. Um, I am somewhat hopeful, um, given that Queensland only very recently got its first woman police commissioner, and that commissioner um, seems to be at least acting so far in a more responsive way from what I've heard with, um, for example, the Minister for Women, Di Farmer. Um, and I mean, I think it does, as we've seen with Dyson Hayden, having a woman at the top does make a difference. The pr previous um, Chief Justice Gleeson knew about Dyson Hayden's conduct and didn't do a damn thing, apparently. Um, and now we have a female Chief Justice action, action is, is taking. Um, I think in terms of the courts and the judiciary, if we get law reform, that would be huge. Um, we have real problems with the bar association, that kind of toxic misogyny. The bar are essentially a group of, um, well, they are a group of self-employed who are supposed to self-regulate and clearly cannot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it would, it's, uh, to answer the actual question 10 or 20 years time, I think that change will have happened. The question is how slow it will be before it affects the average, um, mostly women, but the average person who suffers from any of these issues. Um, it seems like, so in Jess Hill's book, one of the things she talks about that has such an incredible effect is women's only police stations. Um, and it's just so difficult to imagine that getting up in Queensland um, in particular. Um, however, there do seem to be slight increases happening in the police to the specialist um, sexual assault training units, um, but they're still not nearly enough. Like, I think progress is happening. Um, it's just happening much slower than um, we can afford to let it sort of go drift along. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Brie, I think that you wanted to finish um, mm. your section with a recommendation or two. Um, <laughs> so these are actually the events that I have coming up. Uh, one is, I can't remember which one's first in time, um, but one is with the State Library of New South Wales, and I'll be talking with the author of A Lonely Girl is a Dangerous Thing, Jessie Too, um, and that's free to attend. It's on Thursday the 16th. Um, and this is an absolute like cracker of a novel. Um, the protagonist, Jenna Chung, was, is a like violin, you know, like child prodigy virtuoso, spent her whole young life with her mother and her coach, or trainer, whatever teacher, just traveling around the world. She realizes something about her personal life and just like blows that all up. And we meet her years later when she's decided to sort of just pick up the violin again. So it's a lot about identity and stuff, but it's also a lot about like sexuality and masochism and, you know, really dark stuff. It has definitely has a dark undercurrent um, and is like just as far as debut fiction goes, like bam, really good. Um, and the other is for an event I'll be doing at Avid with uh, crowd favorite Kate Grenville. Um, it's her latest fiction, A Room Made of Leaves. Um, and... I have not started it yet, um, but it's basically a fictionalization of um, Elizabeth MacArthur, which um, is very, very interesting at a time when we are, again, asking critical questions about the uh, creation of national identity and history. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And that's with Avid as well. I'm not sure if it's free or not, but um, all the information is on Avid's website. Mm -hmm. M's nodding, I think. Is that Emma? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's free. Yay, free. Yeah. I don't even feel bad about spruiking. Like, it's all free. Like, <laughs> And I, I think oh. we can assume if it's Kate Grenville, it's probably going to be good. Yes, indeedy. I'll drop yeah. the link in the chat box for you all now, actually. Great. 
Well, Bree, thank you so much for that, um, for those insights into your work and your um, working progress. Um, we're going to move on to a few other recommendations now. You are entirely free to stay or leave as you choose. I'm not sure how busy your life is tonight. But um, really, thank you so much for being our very first um, Queensland star on this um, Brisbane Literary Mafia Zoomcast. I think we can all agree that there is something in the water in Queensland that breeds great writers and Brie, you're a fantastic example of that. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me and thank you everybody for listening. Um, I will disappear because the edits are due for my masters. Uh, that is my life at the moment. Um, but thank you very much everyone and um, many safe travels and be well. Thanks, Brie. Night, night. Okay, so Bree's gone um, and we've of course gone over time because you know that she's so fabulous and so much to talk about but um, just quickly the second part of the Zoom cast was always going to be a, uh, some recommendations from me about um, books by Australian writers that I've been reading this month um, and there's so many great, so many books, so little time, so many great books coming out. Um, but I'll, I'll just quickly go through these and um, Sally, if you have any pertinent questions or comments, feel free to jump right in. Um, so the first one I wanted to talk about tonight is The Adversary by Ronnie Scott, which is published by Penguin. All of these are available at Avid, of course. Um, now, this book is, I, when I was reading it, I thought it's kind of like uh, an Australian Sally Rooney. It's a very stream of consciousness um, internal book where not much happens and it's very much focused on the characters. It's um, a millennial Melbourne gay scene. So we've got a group of young gay men who have sort of formed their own um, their own family, really, and it's it's just about um, it's as I said, it's not much happens. It's but it's but it's somehow it's so compelling to just follow their their journey. Um, it's very sharply observed. It's very very funny, and it's you know as we all know, it's hard to write a funny book. Um, it's, it's very literary. It's kind of um, unusual and I think it will appeal to readers who really like to be dropped into the messy life of strangers without a map or a compass and just try to work out what the hell's going on. Um, it's tender, the characters are neurotic, they're sometimes quite often dislikable, but a really great um, debut novel. So that's that one. Uh, this, just just jump in anytime, Sally, if you or Emma Kate, if you have anything to add. The second book I wanted to talk about is The Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams, which is published by Affirm Press. Now, this is a literary historical reimagined tale of one woman who is involved with the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary. And it's her ambition to include the silent voices and words of women at the time. So it's set during the suffragette uh, movement and the Great War. And um, the main character, Esme, um, starts off in 1886. She's five years old and she's sitting under the sorting table at the scriptorium where her father works with a team of people collecting words and meanings for the dictionary um, and deciding what will be included and what meanings will be included. Um, and this is all based on, on true people and true facts. Um, Esme is, is fictional, but Esme rescues discarded words that the men decide are not worthy of being included in the book, mostly because they're related to women. They're either impolite or they're crude or they're unnecessary. So she starts to collect them and then decides that she's going to make her own dictionary. Um, so it's an interesting look at uh, why some words are considered more important than others um, and about women's experiences and voices that often go unrecorded. Um, Esme's story is told through those sort of larger events of the First World War and the suffragette movement, so that um, makes it quite relevant. If you loved Gulliver's Wife by Lauren Chater or The Bee in the Orange Tree by Melissa Ashley or Hearing Maud by Jessica White, which are all stories which focused on the imagined lives of women in a factual historical setting, then you will really like this book. 
Um, it's not Pip's first book. Her first one was a travel memoir called One Italian Summer about her family um, working in Italy over the summer. So this is very different, but um, very beautiful book. Uh, the next book I wanted to talk about was, is this one, The Octopus and I by Erin Hortel, and it's published by Alan and Unwin. This um, book tackles a lot of ethical issues about body image, feminism, environmentalism, sustainability, anthropomorphism, and grief. So it's about a woman, her body, and an octopus. It's, um, it's a very unusual story. It's a meditation on illness, grief, and loss, and how we're connected with the natural world. So it's set in the, um, in the wilds of um, beautiful uh, the Tasman Peninsula. Um, so the main characters are Lucy and Jem. Lucy's recently had some major surgery and she and her partner Jem are trying to renegotiate their relationship in the aftermath of how she has physically changed and how she her body is physically scarred from the surgery. She, um, she feels almost like her body is sort of alien to herself. She's, you know, that, that's the effect that it's had on her. So as she's recovering from the surgery, she's feeling very fragile and unmoored. She connects with some local older women who um, go fishing and hunt octopus. Um, and she gets a sense of how her body's changing. The novel's quite unusual, again, in that it includes the perspectives of an octopus um, and a seal and some other animals. So um, what's really interesting about it is that it's a novel about fishing as, as food and as livelihood and as sport, but because it includes the perspectives of animals, that then um, sets up an interesting conflict between, um, you know, the way that humans um, treat the nature around us and the and the effect that our behaviour has on um, on nature and on the animals. Um, there's a lot in this book to think about morally and ethically. So if that sounds like an interesting read for you, I can highly recommend that one. Um, two more that I wanted to. Speak about something just loudly fell on the floor, my sign or something. Uh, this book, The Spill, which we recently launched at um, Avid uh, by Indy Nimi, and it's published by Penguin again. And this was the winner of the 2019 Penguin Literary Prize. Um, it's a compelling story that explores the complex dynamics of families. Um, it starts with a car accident in 1982. Um, with two sisters and, the, and their mother. And it's the after effects of that accident for the next 40 years um, until their mother's death. It talks about memory, truth, lies, betrayal, love, addiction, misunderstandings and redemption. Um, so it's a really, it's quite a page turning novel. Um, it starts off with the sisters who are quite young, they're just children and um, they've been in this car accident and they're waiting outside the pub while their mum recovers with a few well needed um, ales after she's been involved in the accident. Um, and even from the very first pages, you get an idea of the girls' personalities and the sorts of adults that they're likely to become. Um, the author really has written it in an unusual structure. It's, it's almost like a jigsaw, the way it's put together. It goes back and forth in time a lot, which could have been quite confusing, but I found it quite um, easy to follow. Uh, the characters are, can be quite infuriating and frustrating, um, but, it, you know, that's because it is a fractured family. It's a broken family. Um, it's a family that's been injured by alcohol and blame and betrayal, um, but it's also a family that's willing to look at those things and to try and um, recover from them. And again, it's it's very funny. It's a very, there are parts of this book that are very, very funny. It's sort of all the terrible mess of family laid out um, for all to see. So that's The Spill by Imbi Nimi. And the last book that I wanted to recommend tonight um, but certainly not the least, is How to Be Australian by Ashley Collagian Blunt. And we will be doing a launch for this one coming up um, next month. 
at Avid. Um, this is, this is a, again, a really funny, sharply observed um, memoir um, and a critical and a refreshing look at Australia through the eyes of an outsider. Uh, it's about um, Ashley and her husband, Steve, who come to Australia originally on a one-year visa, but um, nine years later, they're still here. Um, and even though she'd been a seasoned traveller, um, that she was living in Winnipeg with ridiculously minus 40 degrees temperatures or something and she just wanted to go to sunny Australia and, and see if she could make it home. Um, so they decide to come. Um, the first half of the book is a sort of a, a, a wry summary of misunderstandings and miscommunications. There's, there's all of her um, encounters with Australian wildlife, with the cockroaches and the spiders and the crocodiles and the snakes and the, you know, all of that which is all quite scary. Um, there's a lot of um, cultural behaviour that is just completely um, bemusing to her. Um, there's people in the middle of Sydney barefoot, getting on trams barefoot, which she finds, you know, confounding. Um, the coffee is weird. Um, iced Vovo, <laughs> iced Vovo biscuits she has, she thinks has what, what looks like elderly people's pubic hair on them. She just, there's a lot of things about Australia that she just kind of doesn't understand. The bin chickens. Um, so yeah, the first half is, is a lot of that, um, just get that cultural sort of shock, I guess. The second half gets a little bit more serious. It's about um, how her husband struggles to find work. It's about Ashley struggling with mental illness. Um, as she, um, you know, she's trying to write a book, not this book, but her first book. She's trying to do that. She, they're trying to work. They're trying to support themselves. They're, um, they really have torn feelings about whether they've made the right decision in moving to Australia. Um, and then the, the, I guess the third part to, or the third aspect to this book is the, the quite serious themes that, that, the author is very well aware of her privilege in being able to choose to stay in Australia and um, to be able to apply to live here permanently. And she's aware that that's not a choice that's available to a lot of other people. Um, and while she loves so many things about Australia, she also finds it really difficult to um, connect that to firstly the way that Australians treat the Indigenous people in this country. She finds that very confronting. Um, the whole idea of Australia Day or Invasion Day is, is quite um, confronting and conflicting for her. Um, and also the way that Australia, um, the treatment of our refugees, she finds that also extremely difficult um, and she finds it hard to sort of connect her, her way of coming to Australia um, and the acceptance that she had with the very opposite treatment that people from, um, you know, different countries um, and get via the way that they've arrived here. Um, so in terms of that, it's a very respectful book. It's a very thoughtful book. Um, it's a, I think for migrants or visitors, it will be really appealing, but I think for those of us who were born here and who'd live here, have lived here all our lives or most of our lives, I think it's a really refreshing look at our country and all of its, um, contradictions and, um, um, you know, how we might, how people might make Australia a home. So that's my five recommendations for this month. Um, next month, again, on the last Monday of the month, um, hopefully Chrissy will be joining us again. Um, we will have another special guest that we will yet to, we, we are yet to announce, but it will be somebody with a connection to Brisbane and we'll do some more book recommendations. Sally, did you have anything else that you'd like to say? Um, no, it's just before you've we go. added to my reading pile again, <laughs> as, as you tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> and they all sound great books. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us at the last minute and thank you, Emma Kate, thank for hosting. No um, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Yeah, Bree, I, I think Bree's dropped off, but thank you, Bree. <laughs> I think Bree's yeah, Bree's gone as well, so she'll be with us next month, as you say. 
Yeah. And I, we didn't even talk about if we were planning to do questions, but I'm assuming that we're not because we're already, we said it was seven and we're already yeah. at quarter past. So, um, um, but um, everybody feel free if you do have questions to maybe email them in or, or get on to Avid's Facebook or Twitter and put it on there and we'll see if we can answer them at the, maybe at the next um, Brisbane Literary Mafia Zoom session. Sounds brilliant. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thanks again, Cass. Thank you, Sally. Um, you. I'll unmute you all so that we can say thank you now. Um, and um, I've posted all of the links, if you haven't already opened up the chat box, to each of the books that Cass has recommended and also to Bree's event um, with Kate Grenville and to um, Ashley's event, which is coming up shortly. So thanks again for joining us. You're all coming off mute now, so please join me in thanking Cass and Sally. I'm going to switch so I can see everybody. Yay! Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Andy. Hey, Bye. Oh, it's so great to see so many wonderful, familiar faces. People in bed. Have a lovely night. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.